Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Was it a difficult process and could you just talk us through that how it all works because it must be quite difficult. Yeah I mean it's not that difficult for the pilots of the tanker to be perfectly honest I should say that right, outright right. because there'll be fast jet people um, saying you know, that it is difficult for the people who are taking the fuel and actually I, <laughs> I can only imagine how hard it is um, out there on there trying to, to line up with a, a wingtip pod particularly like something like the tornado where the pod moves at the last moment because of the you know the air being pushed by the tornado nose cone um, but for us you know actually it was all about getting in position making sure you uh, got there as efficiently as you could and working out how much fuel you had to give because it was our fuel so there wasn't a separate tank you, you could run yourself dry so you always had to be very careful you always wanted to give as much fuel as you could particularly on operations and you wanted to leave the best case scenario was you left on absolute minimums having given all the fuel you could give but it was very much so most of the time what we were doing was as a crew keeping on top of our calculations to make sure that we had the fuel how much spare did we have if anyone needed it and how much could we give so but then it was mainly about being in the right part of the sky where the the receivers were expecting you to be and then even the actual tanking itself the giving of fuel the dispensing of fuel was mainly handled by the air engineer so they they, they were the ones you know deploying the hoses transferring the fuel um, and, uh, and and you know our job was just to keep flying the flying the pattern um, what we did do while we were tanking was we actually used the autopilot in a manual mode so that it was quite an old autopilot it was quite clunky but effectively you had a turn dial to roll the aircraft and you had some trim wheels to sort of pitch it although you put it in uh, altitude lock and then you would just turn it manually um, but what you would do is be holding with one one hand on the control column because occasionally the autopilot would get out of sync it would get out of balance and then it would cut it would kick out and so you you, know, you had to be bracing for it to kick out you could almost feel it happening as well you could feel the the controls getting heavier as you were maybe in a turn and you could see the height starting to drop off and you knew the autopilot was probably going to kick out um, and you always felt like apologizing over the radio because you know, you, you know there'd be a bit of a kick and obviously you'd have to then try and trim it out and put the autopilot back in so um, you know I, I think it might have been smoother for the pilot to fly the whole time but actually the VC-10 was quite a heavy aircraft to fly manually because um, okay. it's power assisted yeah. controls but it's still quite rudimentary so um, although it was enjoyable I think if you were doing it for sort of an hour flying a racetrack you might get quite tired so hence we use the autopilot. So was the VC-10 just probe and drug? Yes, it was, yeah. So, um, yeah, all, all three of our units um, were at hose and drum. So, um, oh, sorry, uh, hose and drum in the middle. So the Hoodoo, which was the centre line, which was on the dedicated tankers, so the K variants. So that could uh, refuel the larger aircraft. So it was a longer hose. Aircraft would come up from um, in, on the centre line and then it also dispensed at a higher rate. I think it was roughly two tonnes a minute, whereas the wingtip uh, pods, they were a, a, a tonne a minute and obviously designed for the, the, the fighters and the, uh, and, the, and the jet aircraft that would come up. Um, but yeah, so they all, so we would, um, we obviously, I, I think one of your questions is about who we refueled. So obviously British aircraft, but also um, quite often American aircraft, if we were doing um, refueling for um, Optelic or Herrick, you know, Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, but even there, the Americans are split how they refuel. So the American Air Force refuels with um, a boom that the Navy refuels with hose and drake. So we would end up refueling a lot of naval um, American aircraft. So did you have a favorite aircraft to refuel? Yeah, I mean, there's a few that I liked seeing, and partly the variety as well, if you saw something a bit different. So um, I was just lucky enough to see the very final days of the uh, Tomcat. So, Lucky bugger. <laughs> yeah, so something as large as that coming up, and obviously iconic for me being an 80s baby, was, was pretty cool, um, but they quickly disappeared. Um, and then the, the Prowler was always quite an amusing one, really, because I always found it quite weird that when it would be alongside you could see four people and you know it's a small jet but there's four people sat in the flight deck or like flight deck cockpit probably a cockpit all on ejection seats and it just like a, almost like a family outing I always thought you know with two kids in the back so um and probably quite a squeeze but that, that was always quite an amusing one to see and then obviously just you know actually as, as pilots of course we enjoyed getting fuel so as the VC-10 obviously had a probe on the front so we could take fuel um and uh, that was great fun uh, and you know and obviously flying um 
two large aircraft in close formation and when you're actually connected it's really really close i think there's a picture that you've posted that yeah you can see how close you are to yeah. the, the other vc10 or, or a tristar you, know, you can take fuel off tristar as well um so we used to love it as air crew the engineers used to hate it because the yeah obviously the aircraft is not designed to fly behind another vc10 and take fuel so the t-tail sits directly in the you know the jet efflux of the uh, the um the uh, um, dispensing aircraft so there's a mild vibration the whole way through your tanking and you might be there for about 20 minutes if you're taking a decent amount of fuel um but Was that of course, a bit nervy on your first time <laughs> yeah i mean usually the captains did it to be right. to say you had to be qualified to tank but um often other aircraft but yeah it was uh, it, I, I remember they said you wouldn't like it so much if you went down the back and you through the periscope at how much the tea tails wobbling around in it you know but um, and they used to have to do checks when we got back but from a purely flying point of view it was it was great to you know obviously be so close to another aircraft at, of that size and, and take fuel did you see any um, unusual like formations like two aircraft that wouldn't normally be flying together waiting for fuel yeah I mean so on your wing you might end up with a, a real mix of coalition uh, aircraft so yeah you obviously um, tornado gf4s being the mainstay of the uh, the RAF for Herrick and Telic. Um but so you would have those but equally yeah, you'd have maybe the uh, US Navy's F-18s prowlers um, so yeah you would you would they, they were probably the three main ones that you would get you know F-18s prowlers and, and, and tornadoes um, but of course if you were doing maybe the Falklands you'd get the uh, Typhoon and if you were doing UK type um, for exercises in the UK or training, you, you could get a real mix because, again, you know, um, yeah, they're, they're just if we're doing an exercise and it's a multinational exercise, you might get a mix of aircraft. Although, of course, it's a bit more standardised now, so a lot of people have typhoons. You know, so we used to get Italian typhoons and German typhoons, and you know, so, um, but yeah, so yeah, quite a mix. Tanking the larger stuff was rarer. So I remember being down in the Falklands once and having to go and get a. Um, a uh, E3D that was coming down. Oh wow! So we met that, you know, as it left Ascension, we met that about halfway and gave it its fuel that it needed to carry on direct to um, to the Falcons. So, you know, less usual to see something like that, um, you know. And um, but occasionally, and Herx, obviously, we used to refuel a lot in the uh, in the uh, in the Falcons. The Hercules would do a lot of refueling to get their practice in. So. Did you ever chat with the Americans, you know, the 135 guys mm. and the KC-10s? Did you ever swap information or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, quite different different roles in the way like they what the uh, all of the american tankers are boom uh, but what they had what they did was put um pods on the end so you might get a mix they they did operate boom and hose and drogue um so but yeah very different procedures but yeah particularly like when we were based in ali deed supporting um Telic and herrick then um you know in the evenings in the communal bar because you were allowed Three beers a day in LED, so you might go and have a beer after a flight. Um, you could you could chat and, uh, there, and you might have heard them on frequency or whatever, so you might go and have a chat with them. Um, and equally, we also had an exchange officer on the VC10, so we had two actually. We had an Italian exchange officer and a um, an American exchange officer. Oh, so, wow. um, so I I was on the 10 for three and a bit years, so I saw two just by timelines, two two Americans come through and two Italians. So yeah, again, you're there. They are part of your squadron at that point. They're fully embedded. You know, they fly with you as as per they were brick. British crew so yeah you, yeah you really learn a lot from them and they would have come from the equivalent tankers that that nation flies so and did you have much banter with the TriStar guys <laughs> yeah quite a lot of banter with the TriStar guys my housemate actually when I used to live in Cheltenham as a, as a junior pilot was a was a TriStar co-pilot so um, we used to have quite a lot of stick in truth the TriStar did an awful lot of air transport and occasional tanking um, but yeah we did we did have quite a lot of banter because yeah, obviously each fleet felt they did it better than the other fleet but uh, <laughs> yeah I'm going to just go off a bit here because um, I've seen uh, on YouTube and stuff sometimes when they refuel they use sometimes the fighter jets kick in the afterburners or drop flares did you ever see anything like that? Yeah so sometimes they might um, sort of use the burners to accelerate away from you or drop some flares it depends like if they more so the Americans than the Brits like maybe a little bit more uh, liberal in what they're allowed to do but um, yeah I mean although you would usually see a burner on a, a Tornado GR4 because if we were quite high the Tornado would struggle um, and um, as they got heavier they'd struggle more and more and so you would get into this really silly situation where they would pretty much fly with one burner in to stay in contact so I think that they were burning crudely 600 pounds or oh, 600 pounds a minute or kilograms a minute sorry and we were giving a ton so you know they were burning it to stay in to top up that tiny bit so that was always quite amusing just to see them hanging on in there because you know again they're, they're a ground attack aircraft so they did struggle at height to uh, to try and try and refuel them whereas when the typhoon came in um, and we were refueling them far more often obviously they they don't have an issue so they we can go I think that was one of the first times I refueled at the top height of a VC-10. So refueling for us, I think, was 36,000, was the max height we could refuel at oh, okay. or dispense fuel yeah. at. And so a tornado would never get up there, but the, um, the Typhoon obviously could, so I do remember. And there were, you know, there were differences in handling up there. So, um, yeah, it was interesting to see.